Hello there, you are listening to The Screen Queen, where you'll be finding your favorite movie or your favorite television show and learning something new. You'll just have to listen to find out. Here is your host, Samantha Parrish. Hello there and welcome back to the show. As always, and last I checked, my name is Samantha Parrish and you are listening to your media queen, The Screen Queen. So I do find it incredibly ironic that the last episode of Anniversary August is actually a personal film of mine. I have to say that without Dawn of the Dead, I don't think I would have the kind of appreciation that I have for horror films. Everyone has their gateway horror film, and I've actually had several, but this was the one that really made it for me. Of all the horror films that I've heard about or seen pieces of it through my like closed eyes. I'd never seen survival properly portrayed in a horror film. If it wasn't for this film, then I wouldn't have given horror the chance that it deserved. And now it's become one of my favorite genres, so look at that. (laughs) Of all the films that I've talked about, in the horror genre. This one, I feel, does not get enough credit. I don't hear too many people talking about the Zack Snyder remake of Dawn of the Dead. So there's a lot to get into this movie, and I'm just going to go ahead and get with it. It's time to resurrect one of my favorite zombie films. This is Dawn of the Dead. So I want to open up this episode by taking a trip back in time. We're going to get in our DeLoreans and we're going to travel back to the year 1968 when a little film called Night of the Living Dead came out, making the origin of zombies. And then in 1978, George A. Romero made a film called Dawn of the Dead, which served as the sequel to Night of the Living Dead. And since then, George A. Romero has still continued to make a zombie film every single decade. Some of them are gold, some of them are copper, some of them are eh, but nonetheless, he's been the hugest contributor to the subgenre that he created within horror. There has been some people to come through the grapevines and make other zombie films, because I hate to say it, but you're either George Romero or you're Robert Kirkman when it comes to zombies. I'm not the biggest zombie aficionado, but... If you're going to watch something, someone has to do the formula very well. And that can be a little tricky. So when 2004 came along, when the news of the remake for Dawn of the Dead came through, it was a little bit mixed. When you hear that a remake of a sequel to Night of the Living Dead is coming through the grapevines, you're looking at this huge history going back to 1968. Like, okay, you're going to remake what defined a genre. What are you going to do, Zack Snyder? And this was also his first film, so everything was riding on it. He bit off the biggest bite in the horror genre, right in the Romero department. And it still holds up for me, man. But it wasn't just the idea of Zack Snyder being in the way. There was something else that happened that had nothing to do with him. The year before Dawn the Dead came out, a film called House of the Dead premiered in 2003. So with the failure of House of the Dead being deader than the actual film itself, people were already burnt out from zombies. If you put yourself through something bad once, why would you want to do it again? That was what a lot of people were feeling in 2003. So there's a lot riding on to Zack Snyder to revitalize the people's love for undead beings. A lot was at stake here. With the remake of Dawn the Dead coming out in 2004, six years before The Walking Dead would come out, that would kind of be the last we would get of a zombie experience like that before we would go into a completely different territory from a completely different creator. I still feel that I can watch a George A. Romero film and still feel the amount of danger, just like I can watch an episode of The Walking Dead and feel for these survivors. Both of these parties are doing something good. And there's also the Korean dramas. I didn't want to forget about those since it is 
kind of bringing us up to date, so it's a good way to end cap the timeline. The thing that I love the most about the about this Dawn of the Dead is I feel that it stands a test of time without being a product of its time. There are so many movies that we see now that it is getting past the new millennia and it's starting to feel dated. Like, how dated does it feel? Dawn of the Dead does feel like something that came out in the early 2000s. But it's not such a severe product of its time that it outweighs being a remake. It's just supposed to show what's going on in that moment. But the thing that I love the most about Dawn of the Dead in the way that it serves as a time capsule is that it's not just for the 2000s, but for getting us up to the way the zombies have evolutionized in cinema. There are numerous references that you'll be hearing about. One of the first things I learned not only as a film fact for this film, but in general for how horror films are created was in the DVD featurette where Zack Snyder shared um, the casting process to hire actors that have um, a limb in real life. In one of the earlier scenes when the survivors are heading towards the mall, there is a jogger that's gunning out for them. And this jogger has already lost his arm. So unfortunately, no one can give him a hand. And he's gunning for the group and he gets shot at. And in the behind the scenes featurette, they actually um, have a little interview with that man and how he was approached to be in the film and get to play one of the zombies and what he was instructed to do to just basically run like hell, which is funny considering they gave his character name to be a jogger and it's like well that's exactly what he's gonna do but it was him and the legless zombie that is in the parking garage is also an amputee and then when I went to go further my research about this and found out that this was indeed done on purpose to get the feel that these zombies are practically almost real with how they're played by people who lost their limbs but this was done in the original Dawn of the Dead. George A. Romero did employ people with amputations to be a part of the films to play zombies. And I don't know if Zack Snyder just happened to think of the idea or if it was done on purpose to still follow the coattails of the production involved with that. I don't know, but still, it makes the film a little bit more zombie-like. My other favorite part about this movie is Bing Rames. Ving Rhames is the reason I stayed for this movie. When his character is introduced, I immediately felt, okay, we're, we got some kind of safety going on. When I had known horror films at that point, I felt that there was essentially no hope for these characters because no one knew how to survive. But then immediately given a character that knows how to survive, gives me some comfort knowing, okay, I can stay with these people a little bit longer, knowing they have someone who knows what they're doing. I got the chance to watch the film, The People Under the Stairs, which is one of Bing Reem's early films before he would eventually be a huge name with Pulp Fiction and the rest is history. In The People Under the Stairs, he plays a character that has a ill-gotten scheme but still knows what to do when this shit hit the fan. And with his character Kenneth in Dawn of the Dead, he's kind of like a quiet protector. He's someone that I feel will do no wrong just with the way that he's introduced at the beginning. This is a hectic situation where you have the Dawn literally running after you and he's able to protect them in every case. But I also feel that he's not obtusing his authority being a police officer. Which is kind of ironic considering six years later we would have The Walking Dead where we had another police officer that served as the leader for the group. Kenneth isn't exactly proclaimed as a leader but he is still one of the strongest units that earned his place as well as earning the trust of everyone there. And this is something really cool to tie in with that. I found out that when Ving Reams heard of a remake, he tracked down the producers to be in the film. He was hell bent to get in this. That just like makes me so happy considering he's the one that got me into this movie 
and he, he made sure to put himself in there. So Ving became the hero that I can trust, but the big question here that a lot of people had is, who is Zack Snyder? That was kind of the funniest question back in the day, and now you can't go anywhere without hearing Zack Snyder's Justice League, Zack Snyder's um, Sucker Punch, uh, Zack Snyder's Batman vs. Superman. Like, it's, it's a name that kind of carries the same way of, like, you know, Quentin Tarantino. It's either going to be praised or it's just going to be unenthused. There's never anything bad, but kind of the territory that happened in the future of Zack Snyder's career. Thankfully, it's gotten a little bit better from what I've heard, but when I hear his stuff being talked about, no one really mentions Dawn of the Dead. In fact, when his recent zombie film, Army of the Dead, came out, I didn't really hear too many people talking about how he <laughs> did it with his debut, with Dawn of the Dead. And I've seen Army of the Dead, it's there. But still, nonetheless, it just feels like his first film became an afterthought and that's kind of sad even in some of the zombie lists i've gone into i never really hear people talk about Zack snyder's uh remake of dawn of the dead i'll always hear romero but never snyder even though this is forever going to be george a romero's work this the re-envisioning it's still within the same par. It still did the same thing that you would want out of a zombie film. I feel like Zack Snyder didn't overdose this movie the way that it could have gone. He gave the right amount of tension. He gave the right amount of... Everything felt like the transition into this new world. George A. Romero has also spoken about his feelings towards the remake of Dawn of the Dead. And he was pretty fair to it. He went on record to say he had his reservations, but that he did feel that the film had upheld the title of Dawn of the Dead. And I feel like that's going to be normal. You're going to be seeing your work up there that is going to be relatively different. But for George A. Romero to let someone do something different with his vision and the fact that he likes someone's different vision in some aspects, has got to count for something. The thing about zombie films is that it's a survival story. You want to see how these people are going to get through this new era that the dead are walking the earth. There is a new norm involved. Uh, people have to make more executive decisions. People have to find new ways to survive and not kill each other, uh, to not get killed by other things. It becomes a very contrived territory where you gotta be on your best terms and your best skills to survive. But I wouldn't have that if I didn't see it in Zack Snyder's version. It's because of what he did with this film that has made me go easy on him in the other films that he's made. Because I've never forgotten the way that he made a new twist on the same survival story to still be remembered years later. But there's another guy that we have to acknowledge for this film. And I didn't see this coming. James Gunn was the writer for Dawn of the Dead. So here's the funny thing. Remember earlier when I mentioned that House of the Dead was a potential deal breaker for the success of this film? When James Gunn's name popped up, he was immediately ridiculed because of the Scooby-Doo film. Now, I can understand the feeling if I found out that one of the greatest zombie sequels was in the hands of the guy that made Scrappy-Doo the villain, I'd be a little bit worried. However, not many people know this, but James Gunn wrote Scooby-Doo with a crap villain just to show how much he knows the material for how hated Scrappy-Doo is. So going into Dawn of the Dead, this man knew what he was doing. He knew the source material. He knew what people were looking for. I know he's a, a hit and miss with some people, but 
looking at the 20 year time frame, knowing that this was right after Scooby-Doo, and then what would happen in the future of Guardians of the Galaxy, this isn't a bad thing to have on the roster. So to think that this film became possible from a first time director and a writer of Scooby-Doo and they made a successful remake. You don't get too many success stories like that. Knowing these two made a successful horror film together and it still holds up over some of their previous work that they've done. It's, it's gonna make you be a little bit easier on them knowing not everything's bad on the whole grand scheme of their career because they do have a Dawn of the Dead in their mix. But there is one part of the movie that I will say has aged the strangest, mostly because I caught this as time went on. So this kind of became my own time capsule. One day I was watching Modern Family and what do I see but the guy who played Steve from Dawn of the Dead. Now, people know Ty Burrell for being Dad of the Year of Phil Dunphy, but because I did not grow up with Modern Family, this was a complete shocker to me. I could not forget his performance as the dickhead Steve from Dawn of the Dead. That's why I always call him that, because he played such a good job at playing the character that you don't want to die, but you also are not going to mildly turn into a zombie. And to see that same guy playing Father of the Year, it screwed with my head. That was a first for me to have to make the disconnection connection of this man from Dawn of the Dead. But then I can't not unsee him as Phil Dunphy. It became one of the things that almost alters the experience for me to watch Dawn of the Dead, knowing that he would play Dad of the Year. But then every time I watch Modern Family, I'll just be like, man, I've seen this guy do some nasty things. <laughs> Fail. <laughs> It's such a weird thing to have to look at, but it's cool that he got a career in TV, though. Now, with that said, most of the cast of Dawn the Dead has had a very good career. A lot of them went on to go star into TV shows. I saw Jake Weber, who plays Michael, uh, was on the show Medium. Ty Burrell, of course, Modern Family. Mackay Fifeer, I don't know if I got his name right. I'm so sorry. He's been on ER, and one of my favorite shows, Lie to Me. Being Reams is awesome, so he's always going to have work. Sarah Polly finally got a lot of her projects going off. But the one that still stands out to me the most is Michael Kelly, who played CJ. Nine years after Dawn of the Dead, he would go on to the biggest role of his life, as Doug from House of Cards. When I started watching a little bit of that show, I never put it together. I didn't see that it was CJ. I mean, obviously it's been a decade year difference, but that one shocked me the most out of everyone to see where his career went. I was very impressed when I had to go back and watch him and Dawn the Dead and see how his career would eventually go on to. It's actually quite impressive. The thing that I love the most about how this film was aged 20 years later is that it doesn't stand out so much as a time capsule because it lets the story tell itself. There are some horror films today that feel very dated because there are certain things in there like electronics or phrases that make you feel the weight of time. But when you have a film that doesn't really do that, then then it starts to feel timeless. And this is a remake where you want to watch something over and over and over again and feel that it's just as good as the predecessor. And seeing the way that this film has also become a time capsule in itself about the Dawn of the Dead. There's a cool thing that I read where one of the stores is called Galen Ross, named after the female lead who was in the original Dawn of the Dead. Ving Reams is cast as a nod to Ken Foray, who is um, a part of the cast from Dawn of the Dead, still leading in with having a strong black lead. There are many cues that's taken from the 70s and put into the 2004 version that still carries on what made people want to see Dawn of the Dead. And I feel Zack Snyder accomplished that. 
So that is going to be a wrap for the Dawn of the Dead episode. This was fun. This was fun getting to go back to one of the roots of what made me love horror films. And thank you so much for being here for this. And that is going to be a wrap for Anniversary August. I know this episode just came out in September. So I was kind of close. <laughs> but it's time to get back on track. But before we find out what the next episode is going to be, I am taking a much needed break. All right, so here we go. Making the big deep dive. Mixing it up real good. All right. What are you? Show me your secrets. Please be something. Okay. I can be down for that. I feel like that's kind of fitting for September. So I'm cool with that. So the next episode on the screen, Queen, is going to be Castle in the Sky. And I am pretty sure even though this episode is already out, but I know if I hear any screaming in the distance, that's my friends being excited for this film. Alrighty. Well, you all take care now. Thank you again for being here for the event of Anniversary August. It was wonderful to take a trip back in time with you. And until the two weeks are up, but if you want to catch up with me in between uploads, you can find me on my Instagram at the queen of the screen. And if you're interested in a little bizarre crime series I have about some scheming tattoo artist called Inglorious Inc., you can find the series and its prequel, The Company of Crime, available on Amazon. But I have that bad boy in the description box. That was a mouthful. Until then, stay amazing. This is your screen queen, signing off. Bye-bye!